I think the Lord's going to meet us tonight in a special way. So I want you to be in expectancy for a move of the Spirit of God. The Lord says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also in the midst of them. Wherever two or three will agree as touching anything, it shall be given unto them. This morning when we were coming to church, I was with a friend named Mark. We got out of the car. And all of a sudden, there was this, this word, Zion, came into my mind, Zion. And I told Mark, I said, we're going to Zion. <laughs> we're marching to Zion right now. I said, Zion used to be a mountain, a specific place. But now, Zion is, is the mountain of God, is where the people of God gather. And I said, we're going to Zion right now. We came in. John said, turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and he preached on Mount Zion. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful thing how the Lord gives you confirmations. John and I met three years ago at the pastor's conference, and the Lord told us that he was going to join us together, and it's taken three years to do it because I'm a chicken. I kind of shy away from authority, but he's not too bad. <laughs> He kind of reminds me of a teddy bear, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, some, of, some of you don't know me, so I'll just share a little bit about what the Lord has done. I, it's going to be a little smorgasbord tonight. Uh, I started in the ministry 12 years ago. Uh, in the Haight-Ashbury with a group of people that had been called out to serve the Lord out of the organized church. It was outside of the organized church. We weren't um, involved in any kind of church structure at all. We were just regular old roper-dopers. And uh, I was a nudist vegetarian hippie. <laughs> and so... When the Lord called me, I, went, I was going into the desert, and I was taking all my clothes off, and I'm going, God, if you're really real, reveal yourself to me. And one afternoon, the whole atmosphere of this canyon that I was in started to tingle and get light, and it started to change, and I'm just going, uh-oh. I didn't want to be there. But the Lord identified himself. He said, I'm Jesus. He said, I build nations and I tear them down. It's better for a nation never to have known me, but to have known me and turn their back from me. That's one of the first things that God told me. I didn't know what that meant. I build nations and I tear them down. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I am the door of the sheepfold. If any man enters in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, and the gatekeeper will not open unto him. So he, I always thought that all roads led to Rome. But he explained to me that he was the only way to know God. So I accepted him, and he said, I'm going to send you to the people. And I saw a vision of thousands of people, and they were wandering around in a maze of gray darkness, bumping into one another with no direction or purpose for their lives. And then the Lord showed me that there was a light on me, that he was placing on my life, and it was Jesus Christ, and I was going to go bear the word of the Lord. So I started to immediately look around for a staff. Because, you know, all prophets have staffs. In the movies they do. Charlton Heston did. So I had a little... Uh, taste for the flamboyant, so I got a staff, you know, and I, I immediately started to grow my hair a little bit longer than it was, so I grew my hair down to here, I grew a long beard, you know, I, I couldn't tell a secret after the sixth grade, and I, I just had a full beard, at, you know, at an early age, and so I, I really looked like Isaiah's grandson. <laughs> And I was pastoring at Calvary at the age of 19, but they never knew how old I was because I looked like I was just come out of a cave. I wore St. Francis of Assisi shirts with hoods on them and wore a robe, and 
things like that. And I was in a little Baptist, I mean, a little four square church when I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And uh, there was this evangelist from Texas. He was kind of dressed like this. <laughs> And he was the kind of man that, you know, threw the microphone cord around and said, in the name of Jesus, you know, and he's sweating all over the place. And I, well, I got it, you know. I couldn't help but get it. It was like 10,000 volts of electricity. But these people were falling down on the floor. And when they fell down on the floor, they threw blankets over them. And I thought, that must be the mantle of the Lord. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, like in the Old Testament where they threw the mantle over the chariot and he picked it up and he touched the stream. So I thought that, that was the mantle of the Lord. I didn't know that they were modesty blankets. I didn't see that they were just throwing them on the women to cover up their knees. I thought, but I thought it was the anointed mantle of the Lord. So I got my own. I didn't like the, the blankets they were using, so I got a deer skin to be my mantles. And I painted a picture of Jesus on it and I wore it like a cape. So when I would pray for people and the Spirit of God would come on them, I'd take off my cape and throw the mantle over the top of them like this. When the ministry started getting good, I had to get two leathers. Then I read in the Old Testament how there was an anointing oil and, and that God gave a recipe for, so I, I got a big old wine bottle, old one with cork in it, and I got some olive oil from the Holy Lands. I poured it in this wine bottle, and I got a, a cinnamon stick and put that in there, and got a, some frankincense and myrrh, put that in there, you know, a little Catholic flavor. And then I had also, before I had been turned my life over to the Lord, I had been reading a little Edgar Casey, and he put witch hazel in everything that he gave, so I put witch hazel in it too, just for good measure, and I shook it up, and I aged it, and then I, I had a, a deer skin bag that I carried my Bible in that was covered with an animal skin, and I carried my bottle of anointing oil, and I was reading about in Psalm 133 how uh, unity is like the precious oil that came down upon the beard of Aaron, even upon his skirts. So I always wanted to do everything scriptural. When I would anoint people, I would anoint them real good. <laughs> and so when, when the Spirit of God started moving in the ministry and people would go under the power, I'd take the cape off, put it over them like this, take the oil out, take a cork of my teeth like this, and anoint them. <laughs> and it ran down. But the Lord started straightening me out, and, and he led Chuck and I together, and one night we were sharing our testimony in the church for the first time, and at that particular time, there was a core of about 30, and there were about 90 that were attending the church. We had a little church that was about as big as the corner of the room right here. It fit 90 people com comfortably, a hundred tight, and we were at the altar praying that night. There were 15 of us at the altar praying. And the Spirit of God came through a prophecy with K. Smith and said to us, Because of your praise and adoration before my throne tonight, I'm going to bless the whole coast of California. And I thought, Whoo, she really thought of a dilly tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, The whole coast of California, that's got to be God. And when we started to receive the word as from God, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon us, and we began to weep. And the Lord began to give people visions of that prophecy. And then the Lord continued on to say that it was going to move across the United States and then go to the different parts of the world. And that, that when there was hardly any young people going to Calvary at all, from that day on, we went to the beaches and we went to the parks. We went out reaching, taking the Great Commission as if it depended on us, not relying on anybody else to do it except us. And I sense that we're experiencing a second wave of God. 
I believe that we're having a, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, something similar to what I sensed back then, 11 years ago. I, I sense it in the atmosphere. I sense it in the eyes. I sense it in the, in the voices of the people that I, I hear responding to the Lord in this hour. God is moving upon you in a very blessed way. And some of you are, are just new to it. You're just being introduced to it. And I always thought it would continue on and on, and it was always going to be the same. But you know, revival doesn't always continue on. And I want to encourage you tonight to go on in what God is doing. Press into it. Don't take advantage of the timing or the season that we're in. One of the secrets, the reason why there's 25,000 people going to Calvary out there, is because it was a mixture of things. I think it's important to hear the story. First of all, when I first met Chuck and the people that went to his church, they were mostly all John Birchers. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I didn't know the diff I didn't know what a John Bircher was. I used to go take communion with the Mormons. I didn't know the difference between a Jehovah Witness. I used to invite them in and talk about Jesus. But anyway, I was an extreme leftist, marching in the peace rallies and I was against Vietnam. And and here was a whole bunch of John Birchers and they were inviting me in, and you see how much of a miracle that was? To fellowship with the long hair when they believed in, in the John Birch Society uh, type of doctrine or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it, it was a radical accepting, uh, dropping of, of uh, opinions. Then it was, it was the age, it was the wisdom of the age and the zeal of the youth that was combined together. I think that you have that flavor here. I sense that. But you see, the young people were saying, don't trust anybody over 30. Well, I'm 31 now. I have to change my doctrine. <laughs> but that's what the young people thought. Don't trust anybody over 30. And there were good reasons. I mean, you know, you got to understand rednecks, you know, and forgive them. But then the zeal of the youth, the adults at the same time were saying, stupid kids, you know, you don't have a brain in your head. Get over there. The body of Christ functioning together because the responsibility in these days is too great for one man. It's crushing. I see men, ministers having nervous breakdowns because they, they don't learn how to delegate authority. You are a model of what God wants to show the church a lot of places, learn, move, flow. It'll be a little dangerous. Learn how to step out, you know, a little bit more when the Lord says, come. The Lord is saying, come. The Lord tonight is saying to you, come. Let's go into a greater dimension. Now, listen to this. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come unto the light, come unto thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Now we're living in the age of the Gentiles. We're coming to the close of an age. What you're experiencing right now is a period of grace. It's not going to last. The country is in severe trouble. Last
Last week, I was with 7,000 leaders from all over the United States, which included the largest assembly of cross-pollination of the body of Christ in the history of the United States. And all, every one of those speakers got up and said, we're really in trouble. The only help and the only hope for the, the country right now is how the church is going to respond to turning to God. Christians in the United States are spoiled. They are in some other countries too. The enemy does it with prosperity. He does it with prosperity. That's how come people are trying so desperately to cling on to the prosperity doctrines. I don't want to slam that too hard, but I'll, we're, we're blinded by materialism. Now, notice how this scripture says, arise. It says, get up. Get up. Make yourself available. I think that the word for today is availability. I do. I've heard the Spirit of God say that. Availability. I'll use anyone. Now, if you feel a complex and you say, Lord, you can't use me. I'm nothing. You know, when some of you had a struggle to get up and talk, every time that you have an opportunity to share the Lord. Remember, it's not by your strength. It's not by might or by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And if the Lord could speak through a jackass, he can speak through you. All right? Now, it says, shine. This is the countenance of the Lord coming from I love to see freshly born again believers. Can you see something about their countenance? Do you know when somebody really meets the Lord? Because when you look at them, they're shining. They just... <laughs> everything's fresh. Everything's new. Everything has so much hope to it. It's really the countenance of the Lord. The high priest of God used to stand up and lift up their hands to the people and say, you know, uh, let your face be lifted up upon their faces. May your countenance be lifted up upon them. That means what happened to Moses when he went to the mountain. He encountered the living God. He came back to the people and he shined. His skin shined physically. His eyes shined. It was real. It was something they could see. It scared them. He had to cover his face. It was real. We can read about it. And so it says, shine. For thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Did you know that that can be a witness to the people when you don't even have to speak a word to them? Have you ever had somebody come up to you on the street and say, What's it about you? Have you ever had somebody do that? Why are you so happy? Why are your eyes so shiny? Well, if they'd asked me years before that, uh, <laughs> I said, acted. <laughs> but now it's the Holy Ghost. And it, and it doesn't compare to anything that the world has. And this is what the world wants. They want the peace. They want the, the radiance of life. And that's what the Lord says. But it doesn't promise you a rose garden. I like that country western song, you know, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Sometimes I hear the Lord singing that to me in the spirit. I never promise you a rose garden. You know, can you relate to that? Just come to the Lord. He'll heal you. He'll prosper you. Everything will be all right. You won't have any problems. He'll take care of everything. Or go to hell and roast like a chestnut. And we get these ministers promising everything on a silver platter and then you come along a couple of years into the Lord, the honeymoon's over, and you're going, what's this? Trials? Tribulations? Oh no! No fair! Oh, the rapture is coming and it's coming. <laughs> We're becoming Christian escape artists. 
I have my hope in the Lord. I have my hope in the second coming. But let me tell you something. Consider it not strange, brethren, the fiery trial that will test your faith as if some strange thing has come upon you. That's in the Bible. So look at what it says right here. I think that we should be prepared. I don't think that the church is going to have to, have to suffer God's wrath, but I think that pre-tribulation to the great tribulation is going to be bad enough. And I think it's already upon us with the marriage problems and the, the confusion in the head and all kinds of things that are coming upon the Christians. Look at this. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. Gross darkness, the people. Isn't that what's happening? But the Lord will rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And there will come a blessing as we enter into covenant, as we enter into community, as we enter into the things of God. And he shows us a freshness that his presence will come upon us and shine through us, and he'll anoint our words. He'll anoint our efforts. And then it talks about world evangelism. It talks about the, the abundance of the sea. The kings of the Gentiles will come unto you. And they'll be converted. The disciples said, Lord, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom unto Israel? Is it now, huh, Lord? Huh, huh, huh? And he said, The times and the seasons which are set by the Father, they are fixed by him. Don't be concerned. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in your town, in the towns around about, and into the uttermost part of the earth. I believe that the Lord is going to put an emphasis on getting us together. And then it says, they shall, then you shall see. Then you shall see. And you shall flow together. The body of Christ is not flowing together. The body of Christ is fragmented and split on opinions. But we're coming into an hour now. Well, we're going to see. We're going to see the Lord. We're going to see the Lord. We're going to see the Lord in our midst. We're seeing the Lord in our midst now. He's moving down the aisles and healing people. He's moving down the aisles and baptizing people. And we shall flow together. That's the unity that Jesus spoke about in the prayer in John chapter 17. And in Psalm 133. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Now, the Lord ha wants us to act. He wants us to present ourselves so that we can become vessels of this power. Because so many of us have tried in our own human effort to go out and serve God. It doesn't work. It fails every single time. Now, let's enter into some ministry. I'm going to ask for you not to be concerned about yourself. The most anointed meetings that I have ever seen where people are, are not asking for themselves. Not that that's wrong, but I want you to ask for the needs of the people that are here. All right? I'm going to ask for you to, to be a minister. Be a priest. And we'll just quickly move right into this. I'm going to have the adult minister to the young people. I think there needs to be still healing between the generation gap. And so there's some things that the Lord has pointed out to me. Hands are for healing. The gifts of the Spirit are ministered by the laying on of hands. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is ministered by the laying on of hands. There's impartation of authority by the laying on of hands. When Jesus left this earth 
the last thing that he did is he lifted up his hands and he blessed the disciples. And then he went out of their sight with his hands lifted up like this, blessing. The Old Testament priests used to raise their hands to the people and bless the people. I don't think it was for no reason. I think it was for a reason. That's why Jesus lifted up his hands. That's why the priests lifted up his hands. And one more example, Moses. When they were in battle, in a battle that they might have lost, when Moses lifted up his hands, they won. When he put his hands down, they lost. It shows you something about the authority. So the authority lifted up his hands. When he got tired, they lost. So he had body ministry. A couple of brothers propped up one arm. Another brother propped up this arm. And he says, what a glorious ministry the Lord's given me. He couldn't hold his arms up by himself. The work was so great. But that's all he had to do was hold his hands up. And the blessing of God came out of him. I'm going to ask the adults as we move into ministering to the young people, if they will extend their hands towards the young people and really bless them like priests. It's your responsibility to get in your prayer closet. It's your responsibility to hold the young people of this church up before God because they're going to hold a key position in being evangelists and bringing the, the harvest in in the last time. So we're going to give the adults an opportunity to minister to the young people. Dan, will you come and, and, and start playing uh, his name? Is his ointment poured forth? This is a beautiful song. It came out of the revival in Africa, and we'll just sing it one time or two times and enter into the atmosphere of the Lord. Let's sing it through once and learn it good, and then we'll wait upon the Lord. Everybody stay in the atmosphere of prayer and expect the Spirit of God to move. <clears throat> his name is his ointment poured forth. You say the name of Jesus four times, and then repeat his name as his ointment poured forth. Everybody sing, and everybody sing out loud and clearly, okay? His name is as ointment for Lord. Education and colleges. And there's nothing wrong with education, or there's nothing wrong with ad advanced modern medicine. But it, if it stands in the way of God, and it becomes an idol so that it eliminates the supernatural, then we have to put those things to the side and see what God says in his word. And we have to rise up from the arena of the flesh, and we have to soar into the heavenlies, and we have to get spiritually minded about the promises of God. Now, I don't know how to do that. I just kind of stumble into it, one experience after another. I've been defeated. You will too. I went back on staff at Calvary three years ago after getting involved in some spiritual error that the enemy almost wiped me out with, but I was cast down but not forsaken. And Chuck was gracious, very gracious to me, to give me another opportunity to come back and minister at Calvary. So I went back on staff and after listening to people's problems from 8 to 5 for one year, I said, <laughs> if I have to listen to one more people's problems, I'm going to have a bigger problem than anybody in this church. I'm not a pastor. And, he, and Chuck says, well, how about going to Africa? I said, trying to get rid of me? <laughs> so he asked me to take a team to Africa, and that was on a Wednesday. And I went in on Friday, and, and I went to my went to my check box, and the check wasn't in there. He said, hey, where's my check? They said, well, go down to accounting. I, I said, John, where's my check? He said, pastor says you're living by faith now. <laughs> I thought I had it made in the shade, you know. But I said, I was really mad. I'm going, Lord, you know that there's so much money and I was getting all upset and the Lord says well who are you trusting me or Chuck Smith I said Chuck Smith <laughs> I was I had forgot what it was like to live by faith because I had a check coming in every Friday when you have a check coming in that's not necessarily living by faith 
So I, I said, well, I'm going to have to get my old notes out on how to live by faith and blow the dust off of them. So I started to be challenged by living by faith. And uh, I said, oh boy, I'm going to live by faith. I know that God is going to provide for me even better than men provided for me. So I, when you're living by faith, you can't tell people. That means you, they say, how's it going, brother? And you say, uh, ask me again. And then you let them know, you secretly on the side, let them know, well, the, you know, you don't have any money and things are bad. And they could kind of give you a Pentecostal handshake, everything would be all right. But the Lord doesn't allow you to do that. And the Lord says, don't you dare tell anybody that you're, you're broke. <laughs> and so I had a little bit of money in the bank and I started to use that money to live on. And one week went by, a couple of weeks went by, 10 weeks went by. Nobody gave me any money. That's the longest I had gone without anybody giving me any money because they all thought that I was being taken care of. And so I had $150 left and I went on the radio and I told people to pray for me that we were going to go take a team to Africa. Well, I was talking to my folks and I said, did you tell your friends that your son's going to Africa? And my mother said, I'm not telling my friends nothing about you. I don't believe anything you do anymore. When you're in Africa, I'll tell my friends. And I went, bummer. <laughs> Though your mother and father forsake thee, I will not forsake thee. Well, I knew that I had to do something. I knew that I had to, I had to make a, act, a leap of faith of some kind because my refrigerator was empty, my cupboard was empty, my truck was empty, I was empty. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. I had one nickel in my pocket to my name, that's the truth. I got up, put a three-piece suit on, that'll win every time, put a tie on, <laughs> as deceivers yet true. And I combed my, I put some vitalis on my hair and I combed it back. And I went in there, you know, into the Costa Mesa travel, and I sat down and I said, I want two tickets around the world with train passes and visas and the whole, it came to $6,000, $6,000. And the travel agency woman said, boy, you're pretty young to be going on a big trip like this. And I'm a missionary. I'm going to Africa for Jesus. Hallelujah. She said, what church? I said, Calvary Chapel. I go to Calvary Chapel. She said, oh, I'm not a believer, but I send my children to the school. And here I just had made, I had just made $6,000 with the tickets. And I only had a nickel in my pocket. And the devil said, you dummy, what are you going to pay for this with? And she's not a believer, but she sends her kids to Calvary school. And Chuck doesn't even know you're down here doing this, you juvenile delinquent. <laughs> And I, I started to get afraid, and yet there was a voice that said, keep on going, Lonnie, keep on going. And so I, I sat there kind of numb and smiled and backed out. And for three, she said, come back in in three days and pick up, pick up the tickets. They'll be ready. We have to send away to Kenya to get the visas and all that. And it's going to cost you $6,000. I said, fine, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> I, w I was telling the Lord, Lord, you're going to have to sell some cows for me. <laughs> On the third day, I was laying in bed, resting before the Lord. I didn't want to get up. <laughs> I said, hallelujah. It hit the ceiling and it fell back down. And Dee, my secretary, who was working along with me, she called me up on the phone. She said, Lonnie, Somebody just sent you a cashier's check for $25,000 in the mail. And I said, Dee, don't fool with me like that. Now, you know. <laughs> she said, I'm sitting, I'm sitting here counting the zeros. One, two, three. I felt like I won a door number three on let's make a deal. <laughs> and I ran down there and looked at the check and sure enough. And I called the man on the phone and I said, I would like to meet you. He didn't go to Calvary Chapel, 
and I never met him in my life. He was completely a stranger to me. And I, he says, no, I don't want anybody to know who I am. I want to give the money as a gift to the Lord. And so I talked him into having lunch with me, and he said, you know, I want to tell you that it, it was one of the most sweetest experiences I've ever had with the Lord. He said, I was sitting in my office, and the Lord said, you know that kid that you heard on the radio three weeks ago? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm, he's my servant. Send him $25,000. He said, $25,000? That's too much money. And the Lord says, whose money is it, yours or mine? He said, yours, Lord. He said, then send him the money. So he got up and he made a check and he put it through his own little personal check maker. He ran it through and the check maker crunched it up. So he says, I knew that that was the devil. <laughs> and the Lord says, get off of it and make another one. So we got together, sat down. I said, when was that? Uh, he said, three days ago, I was sitting in my study at this particular time. It was the same time that I was buying the tickets. The same time. And they got there on the day that I was supposed to pay for them. And so that the Lord provided for me to visit 37 countries in the last two years. And the Lord is pouring out his spirit in a beautiful way. God sent us to South Africa. There's a revival breaking out in South Africa. One of the sweetest moves of God. People being filled with the Holy Spirit. We went, we went into this one Baptist church, gave a call for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 300 people, 300 Baptists came forward we turned the lights on, opened the windows. The piano player went to the piano. I said, don't play music. They stood in the circle. We pray, and in 10 minutes, those 300 Baptists were laying all over the floor, speaking in tongues. There was no laying on of hands. It was a supernatural wave that went over the people like this and baptized 300 Baptists with the Holy Ghost. They were singing and speaking in tongues. That was one of the greatest baptisms of the Holy Spirit I ever saw. And if you know how stiff and rigid the South African people are, they're very proper, you know. They would never do anything like fall down. <clears throat> there was a black evangelist, 27 years old. He called 23 blind people. I think the number was 23. It was in the headlines of the paper. Came forward in this meeting in South Africa. It happened while we were there. He prayed. The Lord instantaneously healed every single one of them at one time. There were incurable blood diseases. There was a manifestation that the Lord worked with the elements. One night we were in a church and the windows were open. And so as we started to pray, the Spirit of God blew through the church in a mighty wind. It blew the curtains right up to the top of the ceiling like this. <clears throat> and there was a, a, a bolt of lightning and a crack of thunder. And 12 people fell on the ground under the power of the Holy Spirit. Nobody was even near them. They just, this is in a Baptist church now. The Lord was working with the elements, see. And so now for what I have to say, if you'll turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 60, feel the Spirit of the Lord, feel the move of the Spirit. We're entering into it now. I want everybody to be sensitive. I want everybody to seek God and draw the presence of the Lord into this meeting. Just this quick word, and we're going to enter into some ministry. Did you know that the Lord is shifting responsibility from the man behind the pulpit to the body of Christ? Did you know that we're coming to the end of the superstar minister that does everything, prays for the sick, does the funerals, does the wedding, hospital visitations, <laughs> sings the solos, preaches the sermons, anoints the people, 
for healing. It, it's the responsibility shifting on you. Now, some ministers don't want to let it go. Some congregations don't want to receive it. It's a combination of people's faults. But you see, we're trying to tell you guys, it's coming on you, get ready. It's the army of God. We're going to march in our ranks and we're not going to break our ranks. And we're not going to be jealous of one another because what I do is my responsibility in God and what you do is your responsibility and I need you and you need me and we need to function together. The but it's right functioning together because the responsibility in these days is too great for one man. It's crushing. I see men, ministers having nervous breakdowns because they, they don't learn how to delegate authority. You are a model of what God wants to show the church a lot of places. Learn. Move. Flow. It'll be a little dangerous. Learn how to step out, you know, a little bit more when the Lord says, come. The Lord is saying, come. The Lord tonight is saying to you, come. Let's go into a greater dimension. Now, listen to this. Arise. Shine. For thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come unto the light, come unto thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Now we're living in the age of the Gentiles. We're coming to the close of an age. What you're experiencing right now is a period of grace. It's not going to last. The country is in severe trouble. Last week I was with 7,000 leaders from all over the United States, which included the largest assembly of cross-pollination of the body of Christ in the history of the United States. And all, every one of those speakers got up and said, we're really in trouble. The only help and the only hope for the, the country right now is how the church is going to respond to turning to God. Christians in the United States are spoiled. They are in some other countries too. The enemy does it with prosperity. He does it with prosperity. That's how come people are trying so desperately to cling on to the prosperity doctrines. I don't want to slam that too hard, but I'll, we're, we're blinded by materialism. Now, notice how this scripture says, arise. It says, get up. Get up. Make yourself available. I think that the word for today is availability. I do. I've heard the Spirit of God say that. Availability. I'll use anyone. Now, if you feel a complex and you say, Lord, you can't use me. I'm nothing. You know, when some of you had a struggle to get up and talk. Every time that you have an opportunity to share the Lord, remember, it's not by your strength. It's not by might or by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And if the Lord could speak through a jackass, he can speak through you. All right? Now, it says, shine. This is the countenance of the Lord coming from us. I love to see freshly born again believers. Can you see something about their countenance? Do you know when somebody really meets the Lord? Because when you look at them, they're shining. They just... <laughs> everything's fresh. Everything's new. Everything has so much hope to it. 
It's really the countenance of the Lord. The high priest of God used to stand up and lift up their hands to the people and say, you know, uh, let your face be lifted up upon their faces. May your countenance be lifted up upon them. That means what happened to Moses when he went to the mountain. He encountered the living God. He came back to the people and he shines. His skin shines physically. His eyes shine. It was real. It was something they could see. It scared them. He had to cover his face. It was real. We can read about it. And so it says, shine. For thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Did you know that that can be a witness to the people when you don't even have to speak a word to them? Have you ever had somebody come up to you on the street and say, what's it about you? Have you ever had somebody do that? Why are you so happy? Why are your eyes so shiny? Well, if they'd asked me years before that, uh, <laughs> I said, acid. <laughs> but now it's the Holy Ghost. And it, and it doesn't compare to anything that the world has. And this is what the world wants. They want the peace. They want the, the radiance of life. And that's what the Lord says. But it doesn't promise you a rose garden. I like that country western song, you know, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Sometimes I hear the Lord singing that to me in the spirit. I never promised you a rose garden. You know, can you relate to that? Just come to the Lord. He'll heal you. He'll prosper you. Everything will be all right. You won't have any problems. He'll take care of everything. Or go to hell and roast like a chestnut. <laughs> and we get these ministers promising everything on a silver platter, and then you come along a couple of years into the Lord, the honeymoon's over, and you're going, what's this? Trials? Tribulations? Oh, no. <laughs> no fair. Oh, the rapture is coming and it's fun. <laughs> We're becoming Christian escape artists. I have my hope in the Lord. I have my hope in the second coming. But let me tell you something. Consider it not strange, brethren, the fiery trial that will test your faith as if some strange thing has come upon you. That's in the Bible. So look at what it says right here. I think that we should be prepared. I don't think that the church is going to have to, have to suffer God's wrath, but I think that pre-tribulation to the great tribulation is going to be bad enough. And I think it's already upon us with the marriage problems and the, the confusion in the head and all kinds of things that are coming upon the Christians. Look at this. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. Gross darkness, the people. Isn't that what's happening? But the Lord will rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And there will come a blessing as we enter into covenant, as we enter into community, as we enter into the things of God. And he shows us a freshness that his presence will come upon us and shine through us, and he'll anoint our words. He'll anoint our efforts. And then it talks about world evangelism. It talks about the, the abundance of the sea. The kings of the Gentiles will come unto you, and they'll be converted. The disciples said, Lord, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom unto Israel? Is it now, huh, Lord? Huh, huh, huh? And he said, The times and the seasons right, the Lord led me to which have. are set by the Father. They are fixed by Him. Don't be concerned. 
but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in your town in the towns around about and into the uttermost part of the earth. I believe that the Lord is going to put an emphasis on getting us together. And then it says, they shall, then you shall see. Then you shall see. And you shall flow together. The body of Christ is not flowing together. The body of Christ is fragmented and split on opinions. But we're coming into an hour now where we're going to see. We're going to see the Lord. We're going to see the Lord. We're going to see the Lord in our midst. We're seeing the Lord in our midst now. He's moving down the aisles and healing people. He's moving down the aisles and baptizing people. And we shall flow together. That's the unity that Jesus spoke about in the prayer in John chapter 17. And in Psalm 133. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Now, the Lord ha wants us to act. He wants us to present ourselves so that we can become vessels of this power because so many of us have tried in our own human effort to go out and serve God. It doesn't work. It fails every single time. Now, let's enter into some ministry. I'm going to ask for you not to be concerned about yourself. The most anointed meetings that I have ever seen where people are, are not asking for themselves. Not that that's wrong, but I want you to ask for the needs of the people that are here. All right? I'm going to ask for you to, to be a minister. Be a priest. And we'll just quickly move right into this. I'm going to have the adult minister to the young people. I think there needs to be still healing between the generation gap. And so, there's some things that the Lord has pointed out to me. Hands are for healing. The gifts of the Spirit are ministered by the laying on of hands. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is ministered by the laying on of hands. There's impartation of authority by the laying on of hands. When Jesus left, this earth, the last thing that he did is he lifted up his hand and he blessed the disciples. And then he went <laughs> out of their sight with his hands lifted up like this blessing. The Old Testament priests used to raise their hands to the people and bless the people. I don't think it was for no reason. I think it was for a reason. That's why Jesus lifted up his hands. That's why the priests lifted up his hands. And one more example, Moses. When they were in battle, in a battle that they might have lost, when Moses lifted up his hands, they won. When he put his hands down, they lost. It shows you something about the authority. So the authority lifted up his hands. When he got tired, they lost. So he had body ministry. A couple of brothers propped up one arm. Another brother propped up this arm. And he says, what a glorious ministry the Lord's given me. He couldn't hold his arms up by himself. The work was so great. But that's all he had to do was hold his hands up. And the blessing of God came out of him. I'm going to ask the adults as we move into ministering to the young people, if they will extend their hands towards the young people and really bless them like priests. It's your responsibility to get in your prayer closet. It's your responsibility to hold the young people of this church up before God because they're going to hold a key position in being evangelists and bringing the... the Harvest in in the last time. So we're going to give the adults an opportunity to minister to the young people. Dan, will you come and, and, and start playing uh, his name? Is his ointment poured forth? This is a beautiful song. It came out of the revival in Africa. And we'll just sing it one time or two times and enter into the atmosphere of the Lord. Let's sing it through once and learn it good. And then we'll wait upon the Lord. Everybody stay in the atmosphere of prayer and expect the Spirit of God to move. <clears throat> his name is his ointment poured forth. You say the name of Jesus four times 
and then repeat his name as his ointment poured forth. <laughs> everybody sing, and everybody sing out loud and clearly, okay? His name is as ointment poured forth. Jesus, lift it. Here we go.
right here. Let the Spirit of the Lord fill you so that he can fill the others. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let the Spirit of the Lord, the power of God is coming on this guy with a calf. Open your eyes. Let the Spirit of the Lord fill you all through your being. In Jesus' name, the guy right here with the braces, keep your eyes open. Look, open your eyes. Watch, watch. This is a class of the Spirit. Open your eyes. The Spirit of the Lord is moving. The Spirit of the Lord is moving. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, let the power of God come. In Jesus' name, I bless you in the north and the Lord. Let the anointing of the Lord fall. Hallelujah. Let the power of the Holy Spirit come. In Jesus' name. Praise. 